Time now for another edition of Christian Connections. Uh, welcome to the big stage here. Um, Ganim is here with his spiritual commentary tonight, and he's going to be talking about judgment. Uh, our special guest is well, Dr. Olivia Moses. <laughs> Welcome to Christian Connection. It's been a while. It has been a while. Thank you for having me. It's always fun working with you and the LLBN team. Well, you've been a volunteer involved with LLBN for a number of years. Yes, right? almost well, 20. Can you believe it? 20? Are you <laughs> almost kidding? Almost 20. Wow, that's mm -hmm. a big, big commitment. Yeah. So a lot has been going on in your life right now. You're the uh, assistant to vice president of corporate health and wellness uh, with the... Um, Loma Linda University Health Risk Management Department. And uh, what do you do there? Well, I do a lot of things. Uh, one of the things that we do at Loma Linda is we have a homeless institute. So I am the director of the Homeless Institute, and that is where homeless kind of lives at Loma Linda University Health. We also have a corporate wellness program that um, is run out of our offices, and we actually have an employee and student health plan. So you also you mentioned director of the Wholeness Institute, <laughs> assistant clinical professor, <laughs> school it of public health. It sounds more important than it is. Yeah, I'm not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> they gave me a whole big list. <laughs> uh, assistant professor of school of medicine. The list goes on and on. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, God is good. God is good. He's blessed us. All this really good. And not only that, she does all that and still has time to read the Bible, study, and have a prayer life. Well, that allows me to do the other things. Oh, I was going to ask yeah. you, how did you do it? <laughs> uh, but, well, we'll get into that just a little bit later. Sean Michael is here. Uh, he lives in Loma Linda, and uh, well, he's in his last year of nursing, getting ready to uh, take that a big plunge into uh, working for a living. Uh, but he's studying for a living right now. Gonna sing a great song. It's called Still Right Here on Christian Connections. Michael? I will be still, 
John Michael on Christian Connections, what a sweet voice. I really like that mellow sound of, of a gu guitar. Another example of our young people, you know, studying for a professional life, you know about that. <laughs> that probably, was a long time ago now. <laughs> he probably teaches some classes, <laughs> yeah. you know, in, in uh, the weekly study. <laughs> Ganem is here with a special commentary, spiritual commentary. It's... Um, the title is Judgment. Now, Olivia, when you hear the word judgment, what comes to mind? Seems a little harsh, to be honest, that word. Does it? Yeah. The judgment's not really friendly mm. as far as you're concerned. Mm -hmm. Well, let's find out yeah. uh, what Gana means when he <laughs> talks about judgment right here on Christian Connections. Well, thank you, Marlon. Well, folks, I'm all dressed up for court. I'm uh, wearing my tie for the first time in a long time because when you go to court before the judge, you better look appropriate. Hopefully, hopefully you'll earn a favor from him, some favoritism, or he becomes a little bit biased to you. Uh, but speaking of court, we've all seen about courtrooms in the movies. Uh, sometimes they give a good, true picture of, a, of the courtroom and what happens in it. Sometimes it's exaggerated. Uh, Sometimes a real court uh, runs better than a movie, and sometimes they're a little confusing. There is all kind of different court structures, and also goes from military courts. There's, of course, civil courts. Uh, there's financial uh, courts. Uh, there's uh, criminal courts. And, and many of us have attended courts at many levels for some of the ones I just named, or maybe none. But I know we've all have done our civil duty and showed up to court, at least for jury duty. And we know what, we have an idea what a court is like. Well, you know, in a court, uh, you know, you have the judge sitting on the bench. Uh, you've got uh, uh, the, 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 well, the district attorney or the accuser party, whatever the case might be. If it's civil, you're going to find two parties. One so and the other, on the left could be the defense, the right could be the accuser, let's call them. And you got t two people in the foreground of the picture, they're back to us, they could be witnesses or jurors, right? And that's, that's the beauty about the court system. It, it is structured, it has a purpose. So true justice can be done in the courtroom for those who are accused or those who are defending themselves and then you've got the jurors sitting on the side taking notes, and they're the ones sometimes make the decision after they hear the case, the judge's job to bring the court to order and govern the, the, uh, the court process. And the jurors take notes. And in this case, let's call them witnesses for right now, for lack of better uh, other analogies. And there's a point why I'm saying that. And then you've got... Uh, Sometimes the defense put on the spot, ask questions, even by the judge. Uh, the attorney speak on behalf of the defendant, and you hope that the, the attorney of the defendant has done great homework, have shredded the life of their, of, of their client in order to bring justice to their case, right? So uh, it's a complex process, and most of us do not want to go through that process as just as it might be. It is sometimes a little frightening. So uh, the, the defendant uh, present the case, and the accuser present their case, and the judge listening, and we know how it works from there. And of course, there are higher courts. Sometimes the lower courts doesn't uh, come in, the fa in, in, the, in favor of the ruling for the defendant. 
uh, or the accuser, and sometimes it gets kicked out to higher courts. And of course, the highest court in the country in the United States is what, Marlon? The Supreme Court. Marlon said the Supreme Court. His mic is off, so I'm repeating him. And, uh, and that court, we all rely on when there's big cases in the country going on, everyone curious how the Supreme Court is going to vote on that particular item. But there's a greater court over and above all that. Uh, a court where Satan has presence as the accuser and Jesus is the defender. To look at our cases, case by case by case. And we're always, we be told in the Bible, we're always under accusation by the enemy. And who's our advocate? Jesus is our advocate. So what does the Bible say about Jesus as judge? Of course, Jesus is a judge and advocate. Because all power on earth and heaven was given to him by the Father. And it says, for, for he has said a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And that's God. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead in Acts 17, 3, 1. So we know Jesus is the judge because he is appointed to rule the world. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And you find that in 2 Corinthians 5.10. And then it says in Matthew 12, 36 to 37, but I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word have spoken. Now that's heavy. We have to think about, about, about our words and what we say and how we say it because words lead to actions. For by your words, you will be acquitted and by your words, you will be condemned in Matthew 12, 36, 37. So think on this for a second. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that he, I'm sorry, that the world might be saved through him. John three seventeen. So here's, here's the son of God who all authority was given to him. And he was appointed to be the judge, but also he is our advocate. He didn't come to condemn us. On the contrary, he came to forgive us, to give us access to his kingdom. He, come, he came to seek us as his children, as a great shepherd to bring all his sheep to his kingdom. So we have to think on that, that judgment day is coming and the world is moving rapidly and very fast and our judgment days might be coming. And there will be those, I call them witnesses, those who we've done great things for them in our lives, and the things we've done in the name of the Lord, it will all be remembered. But then there will be those who accused us all our lives and cursed us because of who we are and who we believe in. So God, the mighty Jesus, the just, the great judge, will be judging the righteous, and the sinners, and then there will be a whole new beginning for the righteous, a life that will last forever and ever. So we're all, we're all sinners, and we will all be judged, but through the blood of Jesus, we are all saved if we truly believe in him and live according to his will. So is it too late because of our age? It's never too late. Until we draw the last breath, until we draw the last breath, if we know when that was coming, we still have a chance by accepting and acknowledging Jesus is a living God, is the Son of God, and he is the one to redeem us and take us into his kingdom and be with him in his presence forever and ever. Marlon? Mm. Words to consider. Come on up and have a seat, you know. Did that scare you? Uh... No, because the judgment is good news to me. Because he's just because, God. And he's a it judge. means the end of a sinful world. It means the end of pain and suffering. You know, just before you uh, uh, started your commentary, I was asking uh, Olivia, what, what comes to mind when, when 
you think of judgment and you said? Sounds like a scary thing. Harsh. Yeah, harsh. Harsh. Now, uh, your turn. Exactly. It's like, oh no, what did I do wrong? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like you said, there's no need to fear because our judge is God. Yeah. And he knows all of our hearts and he came here just like that last verse that Dan mentioned. He came here not to condemn the world, but to save us. You know, that's the second half of John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Uh, people usually just stop with that verse, and I think that second verse is, wow, it's so beautiful. Because it means that we all have a chance. You know, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, came and gave his life that we may have eternal life through him. He paid the price for our sin. And don't let anybody tell you that there's not sin in the world. Olivia, now that you've heard his presentation, what do you think? It's a lot better. And I think when we think harsh, we think about judgment, how we define it on this earth. Mm -hmm. And the judgment that Ganem was talking about was otherworldly, wasn't it? Yep. Mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't follow human rules. Our judgment is not what we deserve. Oh, oh that, that really touches the nerve, doesn't it, Sheila? Right. Because we all know what we deserve. We know that the Bible tells us that our hearts are desperately wicked, uh, prone to, to all the wrong things. Uh, but the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, gives us the power to be overcomers. Isn't that good news? And that kind of neutralizes the, the judgment, doesn't it? Ganem, any th final thoughts? And no, I just, I thank God that our judge is our creator, our father, and our redeemer. Mm -hmm. He is interested in each and every one of us, and our sins are forgiven through him. As long as we confess and repent and live according to his will, we all have an opportunity for an everlasting life. We live here, we eat well, Olivia can talk to us a lot about living healthy in the blue zone, and maybe we max it out to 100, maybe 105. You know, you read in the tabloids that 200-year-old lady was given a report. There's no <laughs> such thing. But it's an ending physical life on earth. But through our Redeemer, Jesus, we will have an everlasting life. There'll be no sickness, no illness, no courtrooms, no more sin, no more tears. We see our loved ones and we are in the presence of the Creator. We'll be like Adam and Eve. God will walk among us and we will be in His presence at all times. Think about that. Sleep on it, folks, and make your decision to follow Jesus because nothing else in this world worth the material value. Wow. Write those words down or just join us on the replay. Up next, Dr. Olivia Moses. She is a Bible-preaching woman of God. Uh, to prove it, you better have your Bibles ready. She is going to ask you to open them to uh, the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 18. Now, her presentation has to do with the power of words. Dr. Moses is the assistant vice president of corporate health and wellness in the risk management department of the Loma Linda University uh, Health. Welcome, Dr. Moses. Thank you so much, and it is such a pleasure to be here. I have worked, like Marlon mentioned, with the LLBN team, Ganem and Marlon, for over 20 years. So I'd like to say, you know, I met them when I was five. Um, and so I've grown up here a little bit, and I just wanted to thank them for the invitation. It's always fun coming here and working with the entire LLBN team. So when I get asked to do some of these types of talks, I usually pray when I start to see what should I talk about, and what usually God does with me, and I would say 100% of the time, is he gives me a message that I need to hear that I need to remember, that I need to work on. And so really who I'm talking to today is myself. And I'm hoping 
that the words that God is trying to tell me will mean something to you as well. So it is my hope that you hear his voice and not mine today. So, you know, words, um, I have entitled what I'm talking about today is the power of words. And I think that in today's society, we forget that words have power because we use them so very flagrantly. Like they don't affect people, that they cannot make someone's day or hurt someone. And when we really look at it, words, are very, very powerful. So the verse I have chosen here today, as Marlon mentioned, is Proverbs 18.21. And I am taking the very beginning of that verse. And it says, the tongue has the power of life and death. Now, isn't it interesting that the tongue is so powerful, it can really affect those two complete opposites. So while I was preparing um, our little conversation today, I read an essay about um, a young lady. Her name was Megan. And she wrote her experience in high school. So she was starting off high school. She went from eighth grade to her freshman year. And a lot of her cohort from eighth grade was moving on to freshman year. And she hadn't seen her friends all summer long. And so she got new clothes, and a lot of people get to have new clothes before their freshman year of high school that first day. And that new energy, can you remember what that new energy was like when you start school that first day? where all the students are all around you, there is an excited energy around you where people are talking and seeing each other for the first time. Sometimes there's hugs and catching up about what happened over summer. And that's exactly what she was doing. She had her colorful clothes on and she was talking to her friends and talking about what they did that summer and she had gone camping with her parents and her siblings and they had a great time right before the bell rang. And one of them brought up right before the bell rang, maybe Bobby will be in your homeroom. So who is Bobby? It was Megan's crush. Now, do you remember having a crush? And you know, when you're that young, it's like you're the whole world, kind of the sun sets and you know, um, rises and sets in this person when, if they say hi to you or not. So, you know, she goes to her homeroom, she had um, one of her friends was assigned her homeroom, and in she walks, and there is Bobby. And they get to sit. It was assigned seating in their homeroom, and she was about to find her seat. And she found out she was sitting right in front of Bobby. All semester long, she would be in close proximity. She might even get to talk to him. So she goes and sits down. The the second bell hadn't rung yet, so the class hadn't started. She's, she sat down, faced forward, and you know that energy when you feel somebody behind you that may be looking at you? She said, I'm going to turn around. I'm going to turn around and say hi. And I'm going to say hi to him. And he's, you know, in your mind when you're a teenage girl, you know, he's going to profess his love for me. And I thought about you all summer. And can I call you tonight? And she's creating all of these scenarios. So she mustered the courage to turn around and she said hi Bobby and he said hi Megan and then she started talking to him and he said to her Megan can you please turn around I don't talk to ugly girls at that moment do you think that Megan felt life or death by the words that Bobby said to her she slowly turned around and fell, felt the welling up of her eyes, but she didn't want to cry in front of everyone. As, as she turned around in the back, that energy turned to laughing and sniggering. The tongue has the power of life and death. Shall we pray together? Dear Father in heaven, we come to you today with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts that you've allowed us to be here to talk about you, to worship you, to be better in you, dear Lord. 
Please bless us, dear Lord, that the words that I speak may be your words and not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Words are used for communication. Words are not merely a tool for communication, though. They are the building blocks of our thoughts, the essence of our emotions, and the architects of our relationships. Let's think about Megan. In that moment, death. What was happening in her that maybe she would take on for years and years and years to come about her appearance? We have that power to bring life or death. That is a power that actually has been given up to us directly from our Father. Sadly, like we see in this story, words can be used as weapons. How many relationships have been torn apart by a careless word spoken in anger? How many dreams have been shattered by words of doubt and negativity? How many hearts have been broken by words of betrayal and deceit? Have we chosen our words carefully? Have we flagrantly said something that someone will carry for a lifetime? And I will be honest with you, in this complete change in how we communicate with social media, we have the ability and the power to use our words to lift up or bring down. And I will tell you that many really hide behind the cloak of anonymity and say whatever they want. And the people that they spew to become receptacles of the garbage words and carry that garbage and the weight of those words around with them and can destroy. I will tell you, the words we choose and the language we use have the power to affect individual people in our relationships and even in the entire world around us. So let's take something a little bit benign. Let's say my husband, we, let's say we're on vacation and he loses his wallet. How frustrating is that? What is the initial reaction of someone losing their wallet? They'll say, I lost my wallet, let's start looking. As his wife, there are things that I could do in a one-on-one -on -one relationship. I can have a big freak out. I can't believe you lost your wallet again. Why do you always do this? You, I never, I always tell you to keep track of it, put it in the same place. I've given you techniques. I've given you a bright wallet. What else do I need to do with you to stop this from happening? Imagine if I really lay into him in that moment. Let's talk about relationship. Is that helpful? Did he lose his wallet on purpose? Why did he lose his wallet? Most of the time people lose their things because they have too much on their mind, they're in a stressed and hurried position, and then all of a sudden they don't find it, and now everybody's looking for it, and that is not someone, anybody, something anyone volunteers for. So in that moment, do I have the choice to bring life or death in that moment? Could I ruin his day, or could I be helpful and useful in solving and creating a solution to the problem. Something as simple as that. And I will say that a lot of times people in one-on-one -on -one, um, relationships, they make these huge giant gestures. But I will tell you, it is also extremely important, if not more important, to make sure we have what we say to each other every single day that really lasts with people. As we go about our day, let us remember to choose our words carefully. Let us speak with kindness, with compassion, and with love. Let us use our words to build each other up, to inspire, encourage, and heal one another. For this is what we 
are called to do. So one thing to remember about your words is your words can bring death, like Proverbs says, and it can be spread to everyone around us. And you know what? We, if we say a harsh word, we might forget it the next day, but that person holds on to that maybe for decades to come. Again, your words can also bring life. And I want to share with you something that Paul wrote in Ephesians. In Ephesians 4.29, he says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that, we, that it may be benefit those who listen. We will be called accountable for our words. May they be helpful and not cut. Just like when I talked about my husband losing his wallet, we absolutely can be life and be helpful. So talking about words, words are remembered over decades and years and years. If I actually say the term four score and seven years ago, could you finish that statement? And the likelihood is that you can. You will recognize this is from 1864, the Gettysburg Address, and some of you in your mind might have said four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, dedicated to the proposition that what? All men are created equal. What powerful words he said that day in Gettysburg. It was a direction for a nation. We will talk a little bit about that later. But again, four score and seven years ago, just those five words, you could probably finish the sentence. That is how memorable words are. Let's move on to another famous set of words. If I, tell, if I say the words, I have a dream, Is there anybody else that you think about other than Martin Luther King Jr.? Powerful words. Words have the ability to inspire and create goosebumps. Every time I hear him preach or video or audio of him preaching this, I feel something inside me. I'll read you some clippets from this speech. I have a dream that my... Four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but but the content of their character. Powerful words. They were fighting for equality how many years later? So we also have to see our words have meaning and our actions matter. Our words need to be congruent, our actions need to be congruent with our words. He goes on, and basically, this is almost an excerpt from an exact sermon um, you could probably hear in your mind. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Though these words we remember, we remember them from Gettysburg, and we remember them on the Washington Monument, but our words and our actions also need to be congruent. And when our words can bring life, and death, so can those actions behind those words. Words can build connections as well as destroy them. Talking about actions, what if God said, I love you, but nothing that we learn about him showed love, acceptance, 
compassion, and grace. We say the word of God. These are all words that a lot of us have actually built our entire life on. Our whole belief system. And when God says, be careful about your words, he gave us the word, he gave us examples, what are we called to do as Christians? So things to remember about words. Your words can bring death. Your words can bring life. Your words and actions need to be congruent. During the time of slavery, when there was a big division between the North and South in the United States, there was a woman named Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman, in her words for many years, was the conductor of the Underground Railroad. She risked her life over and over and over again to really take people from slavery to freedom. This was an extremely dark time in United States history, and to be honest, in my personal opinion, a very dark time for humanity. And when we talk about slavery and slavery happening today, we treat people like they are not human beings. She risked her life. She could have died many, many times. She went without food and water because she believed that God gave her a purpose, wanted her to be free, and she wanted other people to experience that same freedom. She is quoted here in saying, I have heard their groans and sighs and seen their tears, and I would give every drop of blood in my veins to free them. Action. She not only said, I want to help people be free, she said, I am going to get into it and really do the work. My actions will speak as much or even more than my words. Let us speak words of love and kindness. Let us always remember that as followers of Christ, we are called to be stewards of our words. We need to speak not only love and kindness, but empathy, knowing that even the smallest act of compassion can have a rippling effect that it touches lives far beyond our very own. When we say we love, when we say we are Christians, when we say our, we are followers of Christ, and when we say we are stewards of words, that also says silence may be a good thing. Listening is part of the power of words, is to knew, know when to use them and when to be silent. Let us not underestimate the power of silence, for there are moments when the most profound expressions of love and solidarity can be found in the quiet embrace of a friend, in the shared sorrow of a grieving heart, in the wordless prayer lifted up to heaven. Let us remember that our words have the power to shape our reality and the reality of others. Let us choose them wisely, for they have the potential to bring light in the darkest of corners of our world. May our tongues be guided by the spirit of love, our lips be adorned by the grace of kindness, and our voices be raised in harmony with each other and with all of creation. It is our choice whether to use our tongues for life or for death. And I would like to say to you and urge all of us to choose life.